At the heart of our forest is a pond that, due to erosive forces on the land, is continually filling up with soil, and where, if we did nothing, would soon fill up and be just another section of stream. That really wouldn't be a problem, but I really like that space as a pond, so once a year I have to clean it out. It's a pretty simple job that consists basically of just taking dirt out of the ground, but it touches on so many little details along the way that I think it's substantially more interesting than it looks at first glance. Cleaning out a pond first and foremost is a disturbance to the ecosystem. Most years, I try and choose a moment where it will cause the least impact. I don't want to disrupt the growth of tadpoles or amphibians or any of their eggs, the deposition of seeds, or any of the other thousand unseen processes that can take place in any body of water. So usually it's a job I take up in the dead of winter where activity is at a low. This year, however, we've been in a strange kind of drought where it rains, but not really enough to actually replace the amount of water that's been lost, and climate change has reared its head in my backyard as for the first time since probably ever, the spring that feeds the pond has dried out. And since this is a completely natural pond without any plastic, once it's dry, it's dry. And now that all those natural cycles have already been interrupted, this becomes a perfect moment to take on that disturbance. The only downside to this is that it needs to happen before the rains come, and I've been putting off the job for a bit too long. Rains usually arrive here in autumn and winter, and now finally, the extended forecast is nothing but rain, which makes this the last chance to clean out the pond before it hopefully fills back up. Let's get to it. I start by cleaning away the water hyacinth. It's a bit of a shame, essentially, destroying all these lovely plants, which have a really delicate and beautiful flower, but they also grow incredibly weedy if you leave them alone for too long. And though for a while we had ducks living here feasting on these, foxes have since gotten them all, and the job of making sure these plants don't clog the pond up is up to me. I'm glad to leave about 10% of them a year, which will be enough to grow back and completely fill the pond up by next year. For now, I'll mound up everything I take out of the pond, and I'll use them to make a very simple compost that will degrade and feed an apple tree that's growing right next door. I've also got to clear a cluster of wild knotweed growing on the dike to make space for the soil that comes out of the pond. This does feel like a shame because they haven't yet formed their seed, but it's a silly dance I'm playing with them because the only reason they're there to begin with is because their seeds were in the soil I cleared out of the pond last year, so I thanked the knotweed for its sacrifice and I started cutting. Then, once the dike and the base of the pond is clear, I can start using a shovel and wheelbarrow to start digging out some of that soil. As we say in permaculture, the problem is the solution. I've got all this soil, which might be a problem if I don't know where to put it, but having all that soil is a solution to another issue I've had for a few years, which is having made the dike a bit smaller than I should have. So I can use the soil to widen and strengthen the dike. The thicker the dike is, the better. There will always be little mammals that want to tunnel through or water naturally seeping through that will carve little passages over time that are impossible to clean without digging up and replacing the whole structure. And at this point in the process, it's a lot of repetition. There's nothing to it except taking out soil a wheelbarrow at a time, and that's the cycle I am locked into year after year or for as long as I want this pond in place. And while we leave me over there doing that boring work, I think it might be fun for the rest of us to go into a bit of history about the pond and why it's even necessary to clean it out like this. Every pond is unique and has its own care, its own form of managing it. This sort of cleaning you're watching me do really shouldn't be necessary, but due to a few mistakes I made in its early construction, it's the only way to keep it going. I first dug out the pond in January of 2015, where there's a small stream that runs through the heart of our forest, which I diverted slightly and dug out enough soil to make a pond that was about five meters wide and about a meter and a half at its deepest point. I was incredibly inexperienced at that point, and I'd read a 
bit about ponds and key line design, so I did have the basics down, but I didn't have any practice. And what I had then, which I still have, is a general lack of foresight that's pursued me through all sorts of places in my life. In the process of digging up all that dirt, I needed a place to put it all. And I had the bright idea to build up a downslope dike, which would hold back the water. And that was a good idea. But then I also thought to make two hoogle beds on the uphill side, along with burying some freshly cut willows that I had lying around. So naturally, some of that wood ended up rooting and growing. What I'd done is create a very beautiful pond with very steep walls that I'd made even steeper by adding those beds on the uphill side. And though the problem might have been fixable early on, I didn't realize it was a problem until too late, as the roots of those willows had merrily deepened and thickened, making them a permanent fixture of that pond. Essentially, I've placed that soil in the worst possible place for it to melt back into the place where I took it from in the first place. And the majority of my need to clean out the pond year in and year out comes directly from that early design. And now that you know the story of my poor design, let's go back to watching me move all that soil and we can pity the fool who couldn't have taken a few extra months or years to really study proper pond design before he started with those serious earthworks. What's really becoming clear to me at this point in trying to dig out this year's lot of dirt is that I'm rushing and I'm developing a pain in my lower back, which is really letting me know. I know I should probably stop at this point and start again another day, but I also know that the rain's coming and the knotweeds made a sacrifice for this. So I choose to take it a little easier, but continue on. I slow my pace and start to really focus on my form as I take the earth out to minimize the stress on my back. And it slowly becomes a meditative exercise where I'm focused on my form above all else and try as best as I can to ignore how much more there is to accomplish. And that continues until I notice that my form's breaking, which is a clear signal that I'm too tired and I need to take a break. So I do. And spot my brother taking a stroll through the hazelwood. It's by far like, it's so easy when it's dry. Oh, wow, it's really deep. Where you put all that clay up there? It's on the back side. Holy shit. This stuff is rich in organic matter. Oh yeah, very. It's, it's a peat bug. While I'm on break, we can talk a bit about the soil down here. Before climate change really started showing itself, this land was essentially a swamp for the majority of the year, with the water level usually really close to the surface, and in those waterlogged conditions, the soil becomes anaerobic, which means that there's no oxygen in the soil. So if I remember my soil science, that means that the microorganisms that will become active here will be mostly archaea, which aren't quite bacteria, but like bacteria's great-grandparents. And what makes uh, archaea so super interesting here is that they poop out a lot of nitrogen which makes the soil naturally have a high concentration of nitrogen, which can be really nice for planting. When I was first digging out this pond, the soil was continuously farting. You'd shove your shovel into the earth and hear a little pop, where little pockets of gas would squeeze out and make little fart noises. Anyway, uh, after my break, I'm almost done. I don't want to take out too much soil, because as we learned earlier, the deeper I go in the space, the faster I'll be eroding the soil. So I've taken out enough to cover and add a layer of earth to the dike, while also adding about 20 to 30 centimeters of walkable space on it. And once I'm done with that, I finish by compacting the soil a bit, flattening it out to make it easier to walk, but also to gain a greater contact between the new and the old soil, which should improve the pond's ability to retain water in the long run. I used to joke that if I died, it'd be okay because I'd made this pond. But that's before I realized how much maintenance it would need to stay alive. Now I know that I can't die because I need to be around to protect its transformations. And there's been way too many to cover. There was the dream of fishes that ended with a weekend visit from our friendly neighborhood heron. 
rebuilding the dike more times than I care to admit, and hollowing out logs for the entrance and exit to minimize erosion. And it all goes to show that nature is in a constant state of change, and conservation is the protection and care for that change. And with my responsibility to the knotweed lifted, and this year's small little bit of care finished, I can enjoy knowing that this habitat will thrive for another year. It will become a wonderful place to come sit in summer, to watch the dragonflies hover, and listen to the songs of the frogs. But that's not yet the end of the story, because right on schedule, the day after I finished digging, the rains came. It rained for about two weeks nonstop, and I was really surprised that it wasn't enough. The water table rose, enough to make sure that there was water sitting at the bottom of the pond, but not enough to recharge the spring to completely fill it back up. So it spent a few weeks in this middle space where it wasn't quite full, but it wasn't quite empty. Though it's amazing how low the water table got, what's more amazing to me is how fast wildlife jumped back in to their place given the opportunity. After months of sitting empty, within a day of there being water in the pond, this frog found his place, and within a week, dozens of little salamanders were flitting about. I don't know where they were before this, or how they found the pond, because there's not much habitat for them nearby, but it really seems like nature is continually waiting for her opportunities. And now, jumping forward in time, another few weeks of non-stop rain, the pond is finally back to normal. The spring is feeding the pond, and it's all filling me with a bit of joy. There's a boar in there.